Welcome to Calvary Baltimore B-Sides. With a deeper look behind the sermon, here's Pastor Josh. Uh, Welcome to B-Side. We are in Luke uh, 23, verse 50 to Luke 24, 12. Please feel free to (coughs) turn there. Have some goodies today. Uh, let's let's hop right on in again. Welcome to B-Sides. Uh, Luke 23, 50. Now there was a man named Joseph of Arimathea, uh, Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. And he was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and actions, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. So his being good and righteous seemed to be attributed to to him for two reasons. Uh, first, because his of his actions uh, of opposing the council and their decision to crucify Jesus. Uh, but secondly, uh, because he was looking for the kingdom of God. And Sunday, when I preached this, I connected that looking for the kingdom turns itself into godly action. And I, I think that's what's happening here. Uh, verse 52. And this man uh, went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. So what's really interesting is Joseph is one of the religious leaders in Jerusalem. And here he is requesting to handle the body of Jesus, a dead body, the day before the Sabbath and during Passover week. So two two thoughts on this. First, well, three, one, career suicide yet again. Uh, But also, um, Normally, when you would touch, that's the that's behind the the story of the parable of the um, good Samaritan, uh, and in the event that they helped this man who was passed out on the side of the road, and he died, uh, they would have, or he was dead, uh, they would have touched a dead body, they would have made themselves un, unclean, and would have had to go and isolate themselves for purification. And it seems that story written on the Jericho Road is those people heading to Jerusalem, so priests. Uh, but here, this this member of this religious council, he's touching, handling the dead body of Jesus. And what's really interesting is that his handling the dead body of Jesus is not defiling Joseph. In fact, in handling Jesus' dead body, he actually is pleasing God. So this is a radical departure from that present culture and mindset. Hi, Carlissa uh, and Wendy. Wendy. Um, Secondly, Joseph was willing to handle a dead body to defile himself because he knew it was the right thing to do, (laughs) even if that would label him as unclean during Holy Week. So really, again, you know, this is a good man willing to do a good thing, even if it is going to be very costly, but he does it because it's the noble thing to do. Uh, Verse 55, the women who had come uh, with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid, and then they returned and prepared spices and ointments on the Sabbath. They rested according to the commandments. I don't know if anyone else is going to find this funny. I certainly do. It says that the woman, the women, saw how Joseph wrapped and laid Jesus' body in the tomb, and they returned with spices and ointments. <laughs> what, I, what I find so funny about this is the difference between men and women. You know, I was, I was listening to a, a, a study early this morning, and it was talking about the differences between godly men and godly women. And that feminism really is trying to take women and turn them into men. (laughs) Uh, But we have differences. And when we lean into what God has called us to be, that's okay. (laughs) Um, And uh, this is a very clear thing, I think, that happens in a lot of dynamics between men and women. Uh, So I actually started working at Calvary Baltimore in the facility when I was 16. 
And I started off in that job as taking phone calls and I was part of the janitorial staff. So I literally started cleaning the toilets. Uh, and cleaning the bathrooms and vacuuming the sanctuary. That's where I began. And I remember on a particular occasion, I had to clean the bathrooms after church on a Sunday. This was like Monday or Tuesday or whatever it was. And I remember I, I wanted to do a really good job. Like I wanted to do a really good job this day. And I took a really long time. I wiped down the... You know, the paper towel dispensers. I went through the, the mirror twice, the sink twice. I even uh, wiped down the dividing walls between the, the, between the bathroom, the, the, the stalls. And when I was done, I thought this was the cleanest bathroom maybe in the history of bathrooms. <laughs> I was so proud of myself. And then I remember talking to my Aunt Kathy a few days later. And she gently acknowledged after I was done cleaning it that she actually had to, she went in there and it was still dirty, allegedly. And she had to go through and actually clean it again. <laughs> and so I remember I was like bewildered that that was the case. Now that I'm older, I believe that it's true. Um, cause so many times I think I've done a good job on something and the women in my life are like, well, Josh, you tried. <laughs> and here, Joseph, you know, he wraps Jesus's body and he lays him in the tomb and the women see the job that he's done and they don't think it's complete. Uh, and they make preparations to come back and fix it. And I don't know why that just so tickled me. Uh, that this was recorded this way. Now, what do they feel like is incomplete? What do they feel like needs to be done? What do they bring? And they bring spices and ointments. And why would they bring spices and ointments? And a lot of people like to touch on that they're trying to honor the body of Jesus. But the reality is they're trying to cover up the eventual smell of Jesus' body decaying. They're trying to cover up his stench as his flesh rots away. And so this brings up a really interesting question. If that's the case, and it very clearly seems to be the case, are the women expecting a resurrection like at all? <laughs> no, they're not expecting this resurrection like at all. But this brings up another question. Joseph, he had a tomb. He had burial linens. Um, he had the means to go to Pilate. The question is, did Joseph purposefully not add ointments and spices? I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm mauling through, I'm, I'm, I'm chewing, and I think it may be this way that, that this Joseph of Arimathea may be the only recorded disciple of, of God, of Jesus, that expected a resurrection. Because remember, Lazarus was wrapped in linen clothes. And he, he came out. <laughs> and I'm wondering if Joseph is expecting something similar. I don't, I, I don't have proof, <laughs> but it's something that I'm 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 very curious about because remember, he's introduced and whatever, here's a Bible study technique. Whenever the Bible introduces somebody in a certain way, that is the lens, the filter, through which you are to study that person. For example, in the Hebrews, Jacob is introduced uh, as a Tam son, as a Tam man. That word doesn't mean quiet. It means perfect. He's a good son. So when we then read the story of Jacob, and he's got to deceive his father, and he's dealing with Laban. We understand that this is a man put in horrible position after horrible position. When we come to the story of Zachariah and Elizabeth, and it says that they were perfect, they're righteous. Uh, we understand that, that, that Elizabeth can't bear a child because they're in sin. We, we are to filter it through that lens. Um, and here... Joseph of Arimathea is looking for the kingdom of God. 
He's looking for the return of the kingdom, which Jesus is ushering in, of course, you know, uh, upon his resurrection in a profound way through the giving of the Holy Spirit. And even though it was there in Jesus's ministry, it, it comes through in fuller and fuller ways. So I'm wondering if, if he's expecting something to happen to Jesus's body. I don't know, just a thought. Uh, chapter 24, verse 1. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. Now, something that also should be noted here is that the woman, the women come. To, why do I keep saying woman? When the women keep coming uh, to Jesus' tomb at the first day of the week, uh, they come at early dawn. And the reason why the early church decided to gather on Sundays, um, partly because they didn't want to conflict with the, the Jews at the temple on Saturday, on their high holy day, is because Jesus rose on the first. He rose on the eighth, uh, on a Sunday. And the reason they meet in the morning, and particularly early, is partly because of this text. And that's when Jesus rose. Sunrise, Sunday morning. Now, the women don't know this yet, but when Jesus, but Jesus is just resurrected from the dead. And so from the moment of Jesus' resurrection, we have to understand the church has been gathering early Sunday morning to celebrate the resurrected Christ. And as I shared Sunday, we, we do not, we do not gather every Sunday and half for 2,000 years because Jesus died on the cross. And we gather because Jesus rose from the grave. I was I was talking to a Catholic on Tuesday, and uh, we we I was looking at a church building, and at this church building they had a cross on it, and it had like decorations on it, and um, the Catholic brought up the fact that at Catholic churches their Jesus is their European Jesus is on the cross. <laughs> Um, and then I, <laughs> I can get in trouble sometimes. So if I ever offend you with my, my apologies, but sometimes th something just flies out of my mouth and I quickly made a little quip that the Protestants, he goes, huh, isn't, you know, something supposed to be on that cross? And I said, ah, to us, I said, I said, uh, oh, our Jesus got off the cross <laughs> talking about Protestants on why our crosses are empty because Jesus came off the cross. Uh, we both laughed about it, and it's true. It's true. You know, we celebrate not because Jesus died. We celebrate because he rose. That the, 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 the empty tomb is proof that the sacrifice of Jesus at the cross was accepted by the Father. That those who put their faith into Jesus Christ, into salvation, will be resurrected to new life, just like our Lord was. Verse 2, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed, and that word means to be utterly at a loss uh, about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. This word for um, dazzling is a word that means to flash or to gleam like lightning. Uh, so it's almost as if they are twinkling or, or, or light like lightning is emitting off of them. This must have been one incredible sight. And it says, notice that the, the angels stood by them as the women entered the tomb. So I want you to imagine a stone slab, stone slab, and I want you to imagine on either stone slab, right? And on either side of the stone slab, well, this is interesting. We have two angels, right? What does that look like? I wasn't planning on doing this, but here we are, props. It looks like... It looks like the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant. We have two angelic beings, two cherubs, right? Side by side over the seat of God, which was where, of course, Jesus was laid. 
uh, which I find really fascinating, the imagery there. They've, in a sense, entered into the Holy of Holies where Jesus is. They've entered in. Uh, now, some of you may be wondering uh, who these two men are. We have no idea. Uh, everything is speculation. It could be two angels like Gabriel and Michael. Uh, they could be Moses and Elijah. This could be the two witnesses from Revelation. We just don't know. So uh, it's fun to think about, but it's all speculation at the end of the day. Verse 5. Oh, coffee's so good. I ran out of coffee this morning, and I was like, no! <laughs> so I, I, went to the, uh, I went to Wegmans this morning and in Abingdon, and I picked up some coffee, and I am, like, making up for lost time. This is my second giant cup. Sorry, I got sidetracked. Uh, verse 5. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Is he, he is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Isn't that such a fascinating detail? The way that these two angels, messengers, are speaking to the women, it's almost as if they've been watching Jesus' ministry this whole time, doesn't it? Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee. I just find that so fascinating. From this account, I, it just made me go into like this reflection period. And I, I'm wondering, I'm wondering if then, if everywhere Jesus went, could it be that these two guys were there watching, listening, hearing, observing? And are they the only ones? Could it be that where everywhere Jesus went, thousands upon thousands of angels, myriads of myriads, millions of millions of angels, everywhere Jesus went for every single sermon, every single moment. Could it be that they were there? And if this is the case, as it seems to be, then think about the restraint, the restraint that was needed for these angels to not intervene. How hard that must have been to not slaughter the Roman guards that stripped Jesus naked and mocked him at his trial. How hard <laughs> it must have been for them to not slaughter the Jewish people in Nazareth. As remember, Jesus gave the sermon, they got so mad that they wanted to throw him off of a cliff, off of a mountain, and stone him to death. It's like, that's God, you insolent fools. <laughs> How hard that must have been to not rip the whip out of the hand of his torturers at, at Jesus' crucifixion or the people spitting on him or punching. Uh, just the restraint, just the restraint that was needed to do that. Wow. Um, verse 8. They remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. That word there in the Greek for idle tale literally means nonsense. Uh, the apostles thought the women were speaking nonsense. Um, that's a tiny little footnote here. <laughs> One of the ways, I'm going to, give me a second. The stool's killing my butt. <laughs> you know, I'm doing so good for my back surgery. I am. I'm doing so good. But I can't, like, sit in the same position forever. It kills me. So, sorry. Um, <clears throat> that word there in, the, and yesterday I ate a million carbs. So... <laughs> <laughs> my inflammation's not being my friend today. Uh, that word there for the Greek, uh, in the Greek for idle tale, literally means nonsense. The, the, the disciples thought the women were speaking nonsense. And just a little footnote, 
one of the ways you know, <laughs> you can tell that the Bible, uh, that this is a true story, is because the leaders of the movement frequently describe their own failures. Isn't that great? I mean, the Bible tells us the story without all of man's ego and pride and spiritual pride. I mean, it gives us the story with all of its pimples and wrinkles. And I love it. I love that here Luke is writing this account, presumably from Peter's perspective and some of the women's. And they add the fact that these men, I mean, really were foolish and didn't listen to the announcement of the resurrected Christ. I, you know, and I, I love that they, they add these details. <clears throat> um, verse 12. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb and stooping and looking in, he saw the linen clothes by themselves and he went home marveling at what he had happened. So let's close on some thoughts on the women. Uh, first, first, as the disciples are hiding in a locked room, the women are at the tomb. Now, part of the reason for this is because the Romans would not likely kill the women for following Jesus. But they would possibly kill the disciples. Remember, that's why Peter, he kept denying Jesus because he knew he'd likely end up on a cross next to him. You know, but the women could go to the, remember, they could go to the crucifixion without being crucified. So women had that privilege. <laughs> Uh, let's call it, uh, that the men didn't have. And so that's one of the reasons why the women are at the tomb and the men are not. Uh, which then, thinking of this cultural dynamic, doesn't that make Peter, and we know from another account, John, doesn't that make Peter and John's running to the tomb that much more special? They're not just running to the tomb uh, in a sense of, okay, now they are excited and not feeling down anymore. They're hopeful. I mean, they're literally willing to die to see the resurrected Christ. I mean, they literally are running to the place where they know Roman centurions have been stored or guard, uh, placed. They know that the, 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 the council is observing the tomb. And these people, the, Peter and John, run to the tomb. They... they the women still put themselves in danger, but the men here really are running here under the threat of possible death, which tells us what, what's bubbling inside of them. Uh, but the women, you know, they're still in danger too, and they're teaching us that they have a faith that endures through trial. Um, the women in, in Luke's gospel often seem to have more faith than the men, not always, uh, but often. And, um, you know, there's this deep, nurturing love we see in a lot of these stories of the women here you know they're coming to prepare the spices for jesus's body that's just a, that's a special kind of love um secondly luke gives the name of the women i want you to notice that luke gives the name of the, the names of the women that came to the tomb and one of the reasons luke does this besides the fact that i think these are probably his sources uh, is that when Luke wrote this account, the works then started circulating the early church. And we know that because when you start reading early ancient manuscripts, um, they have Luke. Uh, and so Luke, as a historian, is putting together this orderly account. He's putting in the names of people, Joseph of Arimathea, Joanna, right, Mary, He's putting in the names of these people so that as this letter starts circulating, they can literally ask someone who is there. <laughs> they can, they can, you know, if, if you know, imagine, it's going to be a horrible analogy I'm coming up with on the top of my head. Imagine you're at a baseball game and you catch, you know, you know, Macho Camacho's, you know, Grand Slam that won the World Series. And you caught the ball, and 
let's say you wanted to tell people about it, say when you got back home, and let's say you had a friend there with you, John Welsh, and you say, yeah, I, I, that happened and John Welsh was there with me. So he's my, you know, he can vouch for the truth, the validity of what I'm telling you. And that's what's happening here. Uh, thirdly, uh, there's been some thought throughout church history that the reason God chose to announce the resurrected Christ to the disciples Say it again. The reason God chose to announce the resurrected Christ, not through the disciples, but through the women. And the women then went to the disciples with the news was because death was brought into this world through Eve. Now, I'm not saying that's what the case, but when, when I studied a lot of church history, a lot of People went there. That the announcement of everlasting life has been now brought through women. Now, I'm, again, I'm not sure that's the reason, but I do think it's something worth chewing on because you remember. If because remember, the tomb. Where's the tomb set? What's the setting of the tomb? It's in a garden. So already, okay, we have some Edenic themes happening now. The the note of the garden that's given to us for a reason. Okay, so I believe it's an important note. Thinking of the women in the garden, right? Soon to be in the presence of God. That the actions of the first Adam and Eve, the first Adam kicked us out of the garden, but the actions of the last Adam, Jesus Christ, the moment he walked out of the tomb, as we've seen in the Gospel of John, he's back in the garden. So, think about Eve. She offered, she gave an invitation to Adam to get kicked out of the garden in that fruit. And Adam accepted it and they both got kicked out. But here now the women are running to the men and are inviting them back into the garden through peace in Jesus Christ. So some 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 church historians, you know, or some 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 patristic fathers, church fathers, reformers, Puritans, they go here with Eve that this is almost a reversal of what the woman did in the garden. The woman now is bringing us back into the garden through the actions of the the second Adam, the new Adam, the last Adam, Jesus Christ. Uh, which again, I'm not saying that's what's happening, but it is worth I think chewing on um, because these garden themes are present. Now, fourthly, and finally, Luke is telling his gospel in a way that has lots of parallels to the opening of his gospel. So, the end of Luke's gospel looks very similar to the beginning of Luke's gospel. For example, the babe in swaddling clothes was assigned to the shepherd. Remember, the angels appear, bah, 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 and they say... You know, there you'll see a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. It will be assigned to you. Something like that. And now the women walk into the tomb, and what is the sign of the resurrected Christ? The swaddling clothes are folded. <laughs> it's a sign to them. Also, one of the things we want to gather is that the announcement of Jesus' birth came from angels. And now the announcement of the res resurrection of Jesus Christ comes from the angels. Also, I shared uh, yesterday uh, that Luke's gospel opens with a Joseph. It ends with a Joseph. And just as Jesus' father, Joseph, took Jesus from Mary's womb and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, so this Joseph receives Jesus uh, of Arimathea, receives Jesus off the cross, wraps him in swaddling clothes, and places him into the womb of the earth, into a stone-cut womb. And as Mary's womb was saved for the purposes of God as she was a virgin, so the stone-cut tomb was saved for the purposes of God as it was a tomb that no one had ever yet been laid before. Uh, but there's another connection that I really want us to gather uh, before we go, and that is that the announcement of the birth of Christ came to the least of Israel. Who did Jesus choose to announce the birth of our Savior to? shepherds. 
And shepherds in this culture were absolutely despised. In fact, they were considered thieves because their their sheep, their flock, ate people's grass. It's impossible to know whose lands you know the sheep are always eating from in some cases, but it would be impossible to give the exact quantity or amount of grass back to the owners. Uh, you know, there would be no way to know how much they stole as their sheep ate. Uh, so shepherds were considered thieves in uh, the first century, and they were they were despised in this culture, and that's who the birth announcement comes to. And now the same thing at the end of Luke's gospel is happening again. God gives the announcement of the resurrection of the resurrected Christ to who? To women, the despised of Israel. And 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 he tells them to tell the men uh, what's going on. What do the men do? They completely dismiss them because the women were low in this culture. In this, what had happened in this Judaic culture is the women, you know, grew more and more and more uh, unvalued. Um, and and not only so, you know, people want to talk about how oppressive Christianity is. It's like, you have no idea. <laughs> Christianity has been the most liberating thing for women uh, throughout time. But besides the point, um, you know, not only are these women who the announcement has come to, the announcement has also come to Galilean women who were the most despised women in all of Israel. They were like part Gentile, almost Samaritans, uh, uneducated. They had a backwoods, uh, southern accent, uh, you know, or they were Appalachian women, like that kind of a vibe. And so not only were they women who just weren't that, you know, the, uh, <laughs> they could speak nonsense, uh, but they were Galilean women even worse. And so I, I think this is giving us a theme here, a consistent theme that we want to draw upon, is that God seems not only to value those who the world unvalues, places no value, but God delights in using dismissed people as his messengers in bestowing honor upon them. You know, God used Moses to free the Israelites out of Egypt. When? When he turned 80. <laughs> God used the donkey to communicate to Balaam. Or God used John the Baptist, who was covered in camel hair and ate bugs. Or Zechariah. Or the shepherds, or the women here, or Jesus with a thick country accent, or David as a little kid, or Galilean fishermen, or tax collectors. Do you see? And the same thing is often true throughout church history. God takes the most unlikely people, atheists like C.S. Lewis, men from obscurity like Martin Luther or Charles Spurgeon, and it seems to be God's good delight to use them to shake the world. People that, that instinctively might be dismissive of, that is who God decides to pick up and elevate. Uh, as 1 Corinthians one twenty seven says, But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. So one of the unique things I think we can take away from this is that if you feel unworthy <laughs> or even unequipped to be used mightily by God, well, you may be the kind of person he's wanting to use. <laughs> and one of the reasons you may be the kind of person he's wanting to use is because it brings him more glory. You know, Saul, I'm going through 1 Samuel right now in my personal devotions, and Saul looked like a king. He looked like a king. 
He was big and handsome and taller than everyone else. Sounds like me. And, uh, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> and then he was no good. And so God chose a little shepherd boy from an obscure family. And David was not only... I just even think about David's own family dynamics. He was the least of his father's house. And God says, perfect. This kid's not getting self-glory. <laughs> this is going to be so miraculous when I change the world through this boy that ultimately it'll bring me such glory. And I feel the same way about myself, quite frankly. You know, I... I you know, I know myself, I know, I, you know, I had horrible dyslexia growing up and ADD and ADHD and school was so terrible for me. Oh, I hated school. <clears throat> and yet, I, my family, my whole family, they look at God using me and we are just so blown away and humbled. And, and you know, I'm not perfect, of course not, but... Um, you know, I genuinely am just so humbled that God uses me to do anything because it's so miraculous. <laughs> like, I should not. By nature, apart from the Spirit of God, I'd be digging ditches somewhere. I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what I'd be doing. But um, God has just been so good, and there's no boasting in it in myself. <laughs> it, is, it is His glory. Um and that's just the way that he operates, you know? That's just the way that he is. And so if you feel like, God, you know, who am I? I'm not much. You might be the perfect person. Uh, that The kind of people that he's looking for because he delights in using those kinds of people. And here we see that he uses uh, Galilean women to give the birth announcement. The, the greatest news the world has ever heard, that Christ has risen. Jesus is alive because that's our God. <laughs> so anyways, I love you all. Um, I'm going to get moving with my day. I don't quite know what I'm teaching on Sunday yet. I'm thinking, I don't know. I don't know. No spoilers. I don't know yet, uh, but I'm, I'm chewing. So anyways, let's pray. Uh, God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. We thank you that you rose from the dead. We thank you for Easter Sunday. We thank you for your uh, immeasurable kindnesses and mercy to us. Uh, keep us safe on this uh, wet and rainy day. Let all who are traveling to be safe. God, we pray for all the sicknesses in our church. I just pray for Christine and everything she has going on. Um, all these family struggles that so many people have. God, be with our kids and grandkids and our marriages and God, we pray for Lynn. Uh, we pray for Frank. God, when his breath comes back, we uh, his, just get, get him strong. And pray for Joe and uh, Joanne and all that they do. Bless them. And I think of Laura Pimentel. God, please, we pray that uh, you find the perfect match for her her lungs and bring strength to her body, and her bones, every cell in her body. God, we pray that this is a great success. Uh, whenever the surgery comes, and I pray for Jeff and Debbie and Angela, and just all the Ludies back and all the people at church. God, just please strengthen us and um, be with our little church body. We pray. We pray for your healing hand and a great encouragement. And help us to remember your word this week profoundly. And in Jesus' name, we love you. We praise you and we thank you. Thank you for rising from the dead saving our souls. We give you all the glory. And in Jesus' name, amen. I love you guys so much. I'll, um, I'll get moving. So, love you guys. Happy Monday. Look how much gray I'm getting. I'm getting, getting old. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. Uh, anyways. Oh, look at this. A little show and tell. I, uh, Nathan made me a resurrection scene. He's got the little stone in the tomb. He made me a little cross, which is so sweet. And Caleb for Easter 
made me a dinosaur. So, I don't want to brag, but my kids are super cool. <laughs> Anyways, I love you guys. I'll see you Sunday. Glad you could join us for Calvary Baltimore B-Sides. If you'd like to know more about us, visit calvarychapelbaltimore.org. Our email address is calvarybaltimore1 at gmail.com. That's calvarybaltimore, then the number one, at gmail.com. To financially support the work God is doing through Calvary Baltimore, go to calvarychapelbaltimore.org and click Give. And if you're in the area, stop by on a Sunday morning. For directions and service times, go to our website at calvarychapelbaltimore.org. Live streams and weekly sermons are available on our website, our Facebook page, and YouTube. You can also watch with our mobile app and on Apple TV and Roku. Search for Calvary Chapel Baltimore on these platforms for instant access to great Bible teaching and encouragement. We hope you've been blessed by this week's teaching. Until next time, as Pastor Josh says, study the Word, to live the Word, to share the Word. And join us again for the next Calvary Baltimore B-Side.